I just got uh, this morning from one of our European offices a urgent appeal. This is a, a tiger in the crosshairs of a telescopic site. It's an urgent appeal from the World Wildlife Fund saying this is probably the most urgent appeal that they've ever launched. And they point out the fact that a number of species face extinction. Now that latter point is true. And it's true because they directly, and in some cases Prince Philip personally, killed these animal species. The WWF at its founding in 1961 took under its wing, in particular, the African elephant, the African rhino, the Indian rhino, the panda, and a few others. Now the African ele elephant was, uh, had a population of about three million when the World Wildlife Fund was founded. Today, it's several hundred thousand. The African rhino had a population of 100,000. Today, it is virtually extinct in the wild. The panda, as Prince Philip said in 1990, is almost certainly doomed, although they're trying to take over vast areas of China uh, to try and put forward panda parks to allegedly save this thing, and so forth and so on. Prince Philip, a couple of months before the, w the WWF was founded in 1961, went on a hunt, a tiger hunt, in uh, northern India and slaughtered a bunch of tigers. Now, of course, the tiger is precisely what they're saying is going extinct. The Indian tiger is going extinct now. Now, there's a total uproar around the world about Prince Philip killing all these tigers. So, as he continued on his travels, he put a bandage on his trigger finger. And he participated in another hunt, but with this, this big bandage there, so I can't possibly shoot anything. Now, he and Queen Elizabeth, with Elizabeth with her home camera whirring away, uh, mounted uh, as part of a broader party 300 elephants, and they went out to, to kill more uh, tigers and other species. Now, Prince Philip, uh, it, as the elephants started closing in on various kinds of game, a ver extremely rare Indian rhinoceros, of which there were only 250 in the whole world at that time, came within the circle of elephants. All of the royal party were horrified because they knew that Prince Philip would shoot it. So various people tried to shoot near the rhino to scare him away, etc. As the rhino kept blundering on, Prince Philip took aim and bam. So there were 249 left in the entire world. Now, if the WWF has not been protecting the animals under its purview, what has it been doing? Well, in order to understand that, you have to go back a bit in history and look at the two key institutions which came together to found the WWF in 1961. They are, number one, the Society for the Preservation of the Wild Fauna of the Empire, of course, the British Empire. Number two, the Eugenic Society of Great Britain with its arms in the United States, continental Europe, and elsewhere. Now, in the 1880s and 1890s, as you're all aware, there was a mad scramble among the European colonial powers for domination and territory in Africa. By 1900, a convention was pulled together in London under the auspices of the British Empire to basically set up a series of areas where the native populations who had been conquered would not be allowed in as part of the population control programs of the empire at that time. In 1903, to formalize and to carry this work further, the Society for the Preservation of the Wild Fauna of the Empire was established. The people who established it were the leading lights, the legend of British imperial history. Lords Milner, Curzon, Minto, Cromer, Gray, the great imperial proconsuls of the New Rome. They put this operation together and throughout the decades, what they sponsored most in particular, their key job was to found national parks, beginning in Africa, but then expanding all over the world. In 1933, and again in 38, the fauna, as it was called by its oligarchical members, pulled together conferences to set up international parks. Now, I give you a certain sense of what, the, uh, what Africa looks like in its modern form today, and without the work of the fauna, continued by the WWF, it is absolutely impossible to understand modern African history, nor for that matter, increasingly the history of the rest of the globe. Could we have the first slide, please? 
This is Africa. The dark splotches are the so-called protected areas. In general, if you're an African and you go into a protected area, you will either be shot and killed, or if you're taken captive, you will be subject to disciplinary measures, including confiscation of your goods, your home, thrown in prison, etc. The percentage of the African continent now taken up in these protected areas is nominally 8.2%, according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is one of the WWF co-thinker groups. In reality, it's much higher than that. So the idea, as with the enclosures in the highlands in Scotland in the 17th and 18th century, was to set up broad areas of the countries where the subject population was not allowed to go the better for imperial control. Now, the WWF manages and in fact runs the game parks in five of these African countries directly under its own name. That is, the countries themselves do not run anywhere from 8 to 40 percent of their national territory. It is run by a supranational body, the WWF. In five countries, that's directly the case. In about another dozen more, it's indirectly the case. And in some sense, through training of their disciples as game wardens, it's the case in virtually every single African country. So that's one. That's the first institution which helped found the WWF, is the Society for the Preservation of the Wild Fauna of the Empire. The second, which is much more crucial ideologically, is the eugenic society. Eugenics means racial purity, race science. The thesis is that certain kinds of skin colors bespeak a moral and racial superiority to other kinds of allegedly inferior skin colors. Now, this was put together in beginning around the 1860s and 1870s by a series of people, including uh, Darwin, including uh, T.H. Huxley, so-called Darwin's bulldog, Using the work of Thomas Malthus, they cooked up a theory of the survival of the fittest. And whoever survived, they said, naturally was the most fit to survive. But they said, that, therefore, since the British Empire was ruling the globe, clearly the British were uh, and adding a few Americans in, perhaps, of their type. This was the most superior racial group which existed. And you will see throughout the work of the WWF, the founding of the WWF in, uh, through until today, an intermarried tribe of people, the Darwin-Huxley grouping, using this work of Malthus, which in fact goes back to Venice in the way that Webster had, ident had identified, a small amount of land and too much population spreading and spreading and spreading. Well, what's the basis under which we're going to deal with this problem? Well, we cull the human herd. On what basis do we know how and who to cull? That's the science of eugenics. Julian Huxley, when he founded the WWF in 1961, was also the president of one of the most important institutions of British intelligence, far above MI5 and MI6, the Eugenics Society. Huxley, when he was the head of UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Social, and Cultural Organization, which was founded in 1945-46. Now remember, World War II had just ended. Hitler was associated with a heinous doctrine of eugenics, which of course is mass genocide, right? That's what the concentration camps were for, to get rid of the gypsies, the Jews, other people, perhaps of Mediterranean races, so-called. Well, eugenics had become a bit unfashionable. Here's what Julian Huxley wrote into the founding document of UNESCO. Thus, even though it is quite true that any radical eugenic policies will be for many years politically and psychologically impossible, it will be important for UNESCO to see that the public mind is informed of the issues at stake so that much now that is unthinkable may at least become thinkable. What the founding of the WWF in 61, this had been prepared already in the 1930s in the very direct sense. Huxley at that time was research director of a thing called the PEP, the Political and Planning Unit of Chatham House, that is the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the think tank for the British Foreign Office. The guy who was director was Max Nicholson. And if you go back and read their own writings, what they say is, we need population control, raw materials control, and a world government to assure control of the former two. That is what will define our work in the post-war period. They said that before there was a war, 
They pushed, they and their associates in the nexuses that Jeff Steinberg outlined, they pushed the war and they consolidated the, the uh, shape of things to come after the war, in which this establishment of these vast supranational game parks was absolutely crucial to their design. Their design to cull the human herd. Now, can we have the uh, first of the game parks uh, maps, please? Okay. Now, I don't want to go into, uh, at great length, all of the uh, game parks that are uh, established here. I'll just point out a couple of indicative ones and their role. Now, first of all, you notice from this map as well as the previous map that most of these game parks are established on border areas. Now, for those of you familiar with African history, when the maps were drawn up in London, they were totally random. Most African countries are not demarcated by rivers, by mountain ranges, and so forth, right? So the placement of the game parks on the borders was done for a reason. They could have put them anywhere. They're placed on the border to have maximum cross-border control and destabilization capability. Now let's look at some of the, just again, a couple of the indicative points here. This is the West Zambezi Game Reserve, a game management area, as it's formally called, in Zambia. That's where both the uh, MPLA and its UNITA opposition for Angola were trained. The ANC is trained down here, as was also uh, SWAPO, right, in number two, is just below the west, actually contiguous as part of the Zambezi Game Reserve, although called by different names. SWAPO was trained there. The, here in the Atosha Game Reserve in Namibia were trained the assassins who conduct the third, fourth black-on-black -black violence in South Africa. And I think most people are aware of how that works. In Kata, allegedly goes and slaughters some people of the ANC. The ANC return the slaughter and away you go. In reality, most of this and the continuing perpetuation of it is not done by Nkata and ANC. It's done by a so-called third force. And the third force has been trained here at Itosha, here in KwaZulu, and here on the border of Mozambique in another game reserve. The Kruger National Park, 20,000 square kilometers, larger than the state of Massachusetts in the United States. This is Renamo's headquarters for the savage civil war which is going on in Mozambique. Now, how do these things work? The gangs, as the British call them, and the pseudo-gangs are both financed and orchestrated by British intelligence. Now, this does not say that there are not people striving the best they know for freedom, for national sovereignty, and so forth within the vehicles that they find available to them, of course. That's the, na that's the essence of the national tragedy that you see unfold in African nation after African nation. If you look at the post-war period, the great dream of 1961, the late 50s and the early 60s, for true sovereignty, true independence at last, were perverted and destroyed precisely through these measures. The establishment of the game preserves, and then the running of mass assassination, terror, and gangs and pseudo-gangs out of those reserves. And you see the results, right? You see the results in Mozambique which has barely reached a precarious kind of a peace in the recent election, but with how many hundreds of thousands slaughtered, how many tens of billions of dollars of damage, a minimum of 500,000 people killed in Angola, a minimum, probably much more than that, a minimum recorded $40 billion in damage, a minimum 10,000 people slaughtered, black Africans slaughtered, simply since Nelson Mandela uh, was, was released in 1990, and so on and so forth as it goes, right? Zambia was the staging area. You see the percentage of national parks, of Zambia taken up by national parks. Virtually all of the gangs and pseudo-gangs of modern African history came out of Zambia. And similarly for other parts, of it, Tanzania also had a major role in this thing. You will notice, in the case of Tanzania, you'll notice that this is actually very deceptive. Forty percent of the entire territory of the nation of Tanzania is not under Tanzanian national control. It's under WWF control. Okay, I think that's sufficient for that. Could we have the next map, please? Okay, this, here we're looking at, uh, at e this is basically Eastern Africa. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Let me just point out one uh, crucial point. This is the Kidebo Valley National Park in northern uh, Uganda. What you see here, this is contiguous to Sudan, of course, right? This is where the SPLA rebels are based. Tony Rowland announced himself as the commander of the SPLA in a, a radio interview in 1993. Tony Rowland, of course, financed UNITA on the one side and the NPLA on the other side, financed Frelimo on one side 
and finance Renamo on the other side, finance the Afrikaner government on the one hand, finance the ANC on the other hand, finance the uh, Smith white minority regime in Rhodesia on the one hand, finance Zapu and Zanu on the other hand. What Roland did, and Roland's company was put together through the personal fortune of the crown. The company was never anything but that, right? What Ron Rowe did is what all of these groups, ICI, Unilever, Royal Dutch Shell, you name them, that is what they do, that is documented, that is a matter of fact. Uh, well, I think we'll go, we'll look at some of these other things. Again, these, uh, these are other areas, which a massive train. This is the famous Ser Serengeti National Park, right, in northern Tanzania, the Ngorongoro uh, uh, crater area. Again, massive guerrilla training of all sorts uh, there. I uh, read Chinese in the past, Russian, various of uh, the uh, South African, uh, the ANC had people trained there, the PAC in particular had people trained there, so forth and so on as it goes. Uh, the, you remember the famous movie, some of you, The Serengeti Shall Not Die, the famous movie of the 1950s? That was the propaganda piece to establish this gigantic border of, you know, cross-border territory for a staging ground for, uh, uh, for guerrilla activity. It's been proven, by the way, since all of the native peoples who used to be living in the Serengeti, in particular the Maasai tribes, have been driven out. It's been proven without any question that since there's no people in the park and no poachers have been caught in three years, the reason why the rhinos and the elephants are being slaughtered in the park is because the WWF paid game guards are killing them. With the WWF, of course, well aware of this. This, I think, kind of really brings the picture home. Now, what we're looking at, of course, is Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and Eastern Zaire. Now, in both 1990 and in the April 1994 invasions, they were organized, equipped, established, and the training for these invasions took place out of the national parks in these border areas. Both invasions in 1990 and 1994 came through the game park. This is the Akagera National Park in uh, northeast Rwanda, uh, contiguous to Uganda. This is the main staging area, by the way, for the 1994 uh, invasion. This is a savanna. This is a grassy plain. It's where you can bring up tanks, heavy equipment, and so forth in staging area. More, more important than the 1990 invasion, which is really what set up the stage for the current slaughter that happened in 1994, if you know, if you follow the history of this thing carefully. What we're looking at here is the Gorilla National Park in Uganda, number one. Number two, the so-called Volcans, the French name, the Volcanic National Park in northwest Rwanda, and you're looking at the Virunga Park in eastern Zaire. They come together at that tri-national area. That is where the guerrillas were established, giving a new meaning, of course, to the famous film Guerrillas in the Mist. If any of you have the work of Diane Fossey and the famous mountain guerrillas in northern Rwanda, well, this is the, the, the kind of guerrillas that the WWF like is the G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A-S. <laughs> so this is how this thing was done. Now, in 1980, the invasion was in uh, 1990, right? in the latter part of 1990, October, I believe it was. What happened in late 89 and early in 1990 was massive efforts were set up to save the elephants of Uganda and to save the gorillas of Rwanda. Now, that was interesting because there's not many elephants in the gorilla park in Uganda. The elephants, in fact, are hundreds and hundreds of miles up to the north in the Murchison National Park. So they flew in massive amounts of military equipment to fight poachers in the case of both so-called for the elephants on the one hand to save them and to save the gorillas on the other hand. And what that was used to do was to arm and train the RPF, which was otherwise simply a unit of the Ugandan army. And anyone who knows anything about the area knows that to be true and knows that they were organized, financed, and trained by British intelligence and British SAS. That's the way the thing works. Now, I want to draw your attention to a one of the more... Um, one of the more famous of the WWF's conservation projects in the recent period, which will give you a little bit of a sense of how these guys tend to work. The, there was an operation put together about 1986, 1987 called Operation Lock. Prince Bernard, this former Nazi, who was called by the U.S. House of Representatives 
uh, House Committee on Un-American Activities, one of the most dangerous Nazi spies that the U.S. was confronted with. Prince Bernard took a tour of Africa, together with a guy who would become the head of Africa programs for the WWF, a guy named John Hanks. And they found that poaching was a massive problem all over Africa. And they wanted to deal with poaching, and they thought, well, maybe we have to deal with this in an unorthodox fashion. Let's really get into this problem, even if we have to break some laws to do it. What the WWF financed then, to the tune of well over a million dollars, nobody knows how many millions were involved, they sent a squadron of 25 of the most elite of the British Special Air Services units, S the legendary SAS units, down into Africa to allegedly infiltrate the poaching rings and gather intelligence and carry out uh, actions against these poachers. Now look at who they organized to do this. The person who was the head of Operation Lock was the legendary Colonel David Sterling, the guy who founded the SAS during World War II. Colonel David Sterling has been the personal bodyguard of the Queen since 1952. He was the so-called gold stick in the coronation of Queen Elizabeth as Queen in that year. The gold stick is what the British oligarchy will virtually kill each other for. That is the person who is entrusted with the safety of the personal body of the crown, of the monarch, right? That was Sterling. Sterling chose as his chief operations officer, many of you remember perhaps the, um, the Kurdish, what was it, I guess the Kurdish assault on the Iranian embassy in London uh, some, some years ago, where you had the legendary, the man on the balcony, right, the guy with the hooded uh, mask, right, who was standing there with a machine gun ready to break in and uh, take the embassy back. That was Colonel Crook, who was, who was the head of the, one of the two SAS regiments the most highly decorated figure in the Falkland Islands fighting, and the man scheduled to take over the number one unit, 22 SAS, which was the prime elite fighting unit of the entire British Empire. But no, he doesn't take up that position. And the man who founded the SAS, these two get together, they take 25 hand-picked veterans, including the most decorated Falklands people, the most decorated Northern Ireland uh, SAS veterans, and they send them down into South Africa. So what'd they do? Well, they trained game guards. That's mostly what they did. They also flew a helicopter in Zimbabwe. This helicopter killed hundreds of people. Of the 380 people killed or wounded or who were, uh, in some cases, escaped, they only found 100 guns. So most of the people who were slaughtered, most of the human beings who were slaughtered from the WWF paid for and WWF run helicopter gunships in Zimbabwe were unarmed. Some of the rest of them were members of the military wing of the ANC. Some of the rest of them were opponents of Robert Mugabe, who spoke out against the IMF program, which was crushing Zimbabwe's economy at that point. So that's one thing they did. They slaughtered all the, uh, they slaughtered the so-called poachers. The last living rhino herd in the wild, 700 rhinos, was destroyed by the WWF. It was slaughtered when they paid for it, and the ones that weren't slaughtered were drugged and were sent off to game farms in Australia, the United States, and elsewhere among Prince Philip's cronies in the 1001 Club. That's why there's no rhinos left in the wild to speak of, because Prince Philip and his gang killed them all. But let's go back to this question of training the game guards, the park rangers, right? And anybody knows how the Mau Mau thing was run in Kenya has a sense of this. The whole Mau Mau operation was run in order to commit genocide against the Kikuyu tribe because it's a majority tribe, and whenever you have a majority tribe and independence coming into power, you have the possibility of stability and sovereignty. Why? Because they're the majority. The British policy, as anyone, again, who knows Africa history is quite aware, is to put a minority in power, a minority tribe, and to keep them always at war amongst each other. So out of the parks, and using the game wardens of the parks, the British cooked up, largely, the so-called Mau Mau insurgency, and then slaughtered tens of thousands of Kenyans, uh, in mostly Kikuyu, but others as well, to set the conditions for the kind of government they wanted in Kenya in the post-war period. So what were they doing down here? What were they doing in, in Africa, in Southern Africa, in 1988, 1989, 1990, and still to today? Training the game guards. Well, some of the game guards, I pointed out, Itosha Park in Namibia. Those game guards, which they were formerly called the Kerfoot unit, that is the it's Afrikaans, an Afrikaans term, the crowbar squad were, were notorious for their butchery and their savagery. They were black units, right? Used against SWAPO in the Namibian Liberation War. 
Now, not to, this is not to choose sides or anything like that, because the British play all sides against the middle, but that's who they were, the Kerfoot units, on the side of the minority government at that point. Now, these Kerfoot units were retrained in 88, in 89, and in 90, there in Atosha National Park by WWF people, by Sterling's people, by Colonel Crook and others, the aptly named Colonel Crook, I might add. And later on, these game guards, these former Kerfoot people, constituted the stock theft unit in South Africa, of the South African police. Many of you remember the Boy Patong massacre in 1992 in South Africa. 39 people slaughtered and dozens and dozens more injured. Right? Again, third force violence at a crucial point in the, in the transition, the political transition there. Who did it turn out to be that was named by both white and prominent white and black circles, including ANC intelligence, including the Goldstone Commission, so forth in South Africa, that carried out the slaughter, but the stock theft unit? Where were they based? They were based at Goldfields Mine, at a mine owned by the British company Goldfields. Who's Goldfields? Its chief executive, the longtime key figure in the 1001 Club and in the WWF. That's the way this thing works. When we say that Prince Philip is guilty of genocide, that, that charge can be backed up chapter and verse. He says it, as Jeff Steinberg, he says, I want to kill people. His eugenics society has said, and the founders of the WWF, which came out of the eugenics society, have said again and again and again, we want to kill black people, brown people, etc. I have some beautiful quotes, horrible but beautiful, which I'll we'll read in the question period if, if it comes up again. They say they want to kill people, and then they set up an institution which goes out and conducts in its own name, under cover of saving the animals, the slaughter that does result in precisely the extinction that they called for. So I submit, uh, as Mr. LaRouche would say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as the person who has drawn up, Mr. LaRouche is the person who's drawn up the bill of indictment uh, on this crowd, that these people are guilty as charged. I think the evidence is overwhelming. It's begun to break in the London press. Uh, the mass circulation of the people, which is the Sunday press over there, is sort of a sex and scandal sheet, but read by 5.6 million people uh, every Sunday. That broke these charges, and you're going to hear these charges echoing around the world in the period to come. Thank you. To conclude, which is my task here, it's important to note that this is a, uh, a plan of action, a group of people, a concert of action, who of which are carrying out a policy of genocide which no nation is exempt in any part of the world. And in our package, we have gone through that at least to identify. I can inform you that we are now working on more elaborated, detailed documentation of this case of the WWF and Royal Crown policy of genocide, <clears throat> for example, against the nation of China, against uh, other parts of the world. Tonight, or this afternoon, we're going to finish with the case of the Americas. Because there's a very specific uh, idea and concept that com jumps out of you that's un inescapable when you look at this policy in the Americas. And that is the concept that these people have of people as animals. And you see it in the name and the face of indigenism which is now tearing apart, in particular, Ibero-America and Canada, in armed insurgencies such as Shining Path and the Zapatistas in Chiapas. Um, and these people who view man as animals are using the indigenous movement today as the principal means to cull the human flock as a whole. And you can see this in the case of the Americas. But let's go straight to the maps. Um, now, I just want to note a few things generally, not all the things that we've even noted. If you look at the total amount of protected area, as we have calculated it thus far, it's 13.2 percent of the total area of South America. I would submit to you that this is vastly underestimated. Now, since we've begun this work, and I do recommend that people work through the documentation, familiarize themselves with the maps, learn the categories that these people use, because you 
as you go back to your nations, will be able to refine this picture we've developed. For example, in the case of Argentina, we used, as we did for most of the areas, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Statistics. These are very low in most cases, and they vary. Some countries are more accurate than others. In the case of Argentina, the figures that we have discovered since we produced this is that 36% of the country is a so-called protected area. So I submit that you will find that these figures are going to change as we get more refined national-based statistics. Second of all, what do you notice about the area? If you know anything about the South American drug production, centered in the Amazon region, in the Amazon basin. Note the density of parks in that area. Look particularly at point number four, all right? That's in Peru. Now, that is a reserved area, an ecological reserved area in the Huayaga Valley. That is the heart of the coca producing region in Peru. Peru being one of the two largest producers of coca, which, as you know, is used for cocaine in the world. Uh, take the, as in Africa, you see the cross-border case. Right? These are, many of these are concentrated on the borders. For today's purpose, look at number one. Now, what you're looking at there is <coughs> the indigenous reserve of the Yanomami Park. It's an area, it's divided in two. One side is Brazilian, and that's a strictly called the Yanomami Park, and the other side in Venezuela is called the Alto Orinoco Biosphere Reserve run by UNESCO of Mr. Huxley's fame. Both, this is an area of about 178,000 square kilometers. In other words, something short, just shy of the territory of the state of Uruguay that has been crea was created in 1991, I might add, by two presidents who were driven from power on uh, charges of corruption, Carlos Andres Perez and uh, Color de Melo. They're no longer around. And the creators of the Yanomami Parks are a little worried because they don't have the instrument at hand to actually put through their program that they want. Now, this park was created on, in order to protect some 16,000 semi-nomadic Indians who lived in some of the most primitive, horrible conditions known to man. They practice cannibalism and infanticide. I mean, they kill any child that they want to. They die at half the national, at their average lifespan is half the national lifespan of the rest of the nation, for example, in Venezuela. Average age, die at 35. If they continue in this culture, they will disappear. The creators of the Yanomami Park knowingly are attempting to set up a green wall around these, it, under, out of which the Yanomami people, I submit they are human beings, cannot escape. They cannot go out. They cannot change their culture. They cannot do that. And therefore, they are going to die. That's the policy of the World Wildlife Fund. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole documentation here, but we know and we have documented that the creation of the Yanomami Park was a personal uh, task of the British Royal Family and the World Wildlife Fund. It was carried out by an organization set up by, as an offshoot of the World Wildlife Fund in 1969, which was originally called the Primitive Peoples Fund. That name was a little too harsh, they said. In Africa and in the United States, people sort of said, well, this just doesn't fly. So they renamed that organization Survival International. And many of you may have run across them. They're an international organization which campaigns for the defense of tribal peoples. The defense. The, uh, the tribal peoples must stay as only tribal peoples. It was funded by the World Wildlife Fund. Sir Peter Scott, chairman of the World Wildlife Fund, was one of the sponsors of Survival International. Uh, several of the other people involved in it came out of the World Wildlife Fund. Financier of the operation, Teddy Goldsmith, one of the most, the leader of the magazine called The Ecologist, one of the most rabid anti-industrial uh, magazines on the face of the earth. And its first 
and major task from its formation in 1969 was the creation of the Yanomami Park. For the first three years, Survival International targeted Brazil and Brazil's policy of assimilating its very small Indian population into its national structure. Now, there's another thing that stands out about the uh, Yanomami Park. When looking at this, we discovered that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has eight categories that they recognize with different kinds of protected areas. You can have natural, uh, national forests, you can have parks where people cannot go in, you can have parks for ecology, you can have parks for tourism, various ca different categories of protection. Category number seven of the IUCN is quote unquote an anthropological reserve. Now on this map, you can't tell the difference between what's an animal reserve a nature reserve, and a people's reserve, because they have no distinction. But all I can tell you is that in Colombia, this is very advanced. They have 250 Indian reserves, Category 7, IUCN. And Brazil has 253 already demarcated and is going towards 514 Indian reserves, anthropological zoos. Okay, now what do they do with the Indians that they protect? Look at Number five, that's in Peru. That's a park called the Apurimac Reserve. It's an ecological reserve located between uh, two rivers and near the Eni River. The park rangers for the Apurimac Reserve was Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso. When the Peruvian army finally got fought its way in to the area, they found 1,200 bodies of Ashinanka Indians buried in mass graves, 300 mass graves, that they had operated in there. There are 5,000 missing of these Indians. No one knows what has happened to them. Now, if you think that London has nothing to do with Shining Path, you're very wrong. The Peruvian government, has, over a number of years, has attempted to get the British government to shut down a, the center of propaganda for Shining Path that's run out of London and to no avail. But then in 1992, uh, in August, a British government agency known as the Independent Broadcasting Authority, IBA, whose chief is appointed by the home, home office, produced for Shining Path the sole international documentary propaganda film that Shining Path has shown around the world. IBA, the Internet Independent Broadcasting Authority, sent its reporters to Peru. They accompanied Sendero Luminoso to, the, to, to their films, to their fields, their killing fields. They filmed them. They broadcasted it on British TV. And then lo and behold, we start getting in our center flyers from the Revolutionary Communist Party in the United States, which backs Shining Path, saying, come see, we've got the first documentary film produced by IBA. It was fundraising for Shining Path, run by this home office controlled outfit. So the park rangers of the Apurimac Reserve tell us what these people view about Indians. They want to kill them. Um, the next slide. I'm going to, given the time, and I want people to have time to ask, ask some questions, I'm going to skip most of the Central American aspect, although there's just some crucial things. One thing I want to note is there is a plan afoot to create one single uh, park all the way through this called the Paseo Pantera. It's a path for panthers to run up and down. And you know, these panthers, they really need to be all connected, and that right now they have to run through human territory, and that can't be allowed. So this is what is being discussed. And this, I identify for anybody who knows some history, is the Mosquito Coast. And if anybody uh, later wants to see, I have maps we've produced for a coming issue of EIR of what uh, this Honduras and Nicaragua, this is Honduras, this being Nicaragua, looked like in 1850 when the entirety of this region was a protectorate, an Indian protectorate run by the British Crown called Mosquitia. Today it's being reconstituted and we have the maps for what it's projected to look like in the year 2000. And it's going to look an awful lot like 1850. Now, you have to hold... Now, here's where you see... In the, in our, I, I ask you to read the section on the Americas. We detail there 
the role of the WWF in the four major parks that are in Chiapas, out of which drugs and the Zapatistas are deployed. I'm not going to review it here. But what I want to point to is the other second way in which indigenism works, because this isn't just focused on using Indians to keep these Indians behind their green walls so that they cannot become human beings. All right, that's a very small portion of the human race that they're directly killing through indigenism. Indigenism is also deployed by the British Crown and the WWF to destroy the global economy and to return all of man back to a state of hunting and gathering, nomadism, pastoral, you know, whatever. And in the case of Chiapas, this is very interesting. In May of 1994, Teddy Goldsmith's magazine, The Ecologist, endorsed the Zapatista uprising. And he endorsed it on the basis that you know, most people think, I mean, if you think about what the media said, what has the media said? That the Zapatista Indians, the EZLN, are an uprising because they've been left in backwardness. And that, you know, an unfair treatment. That's not what the ecologist said. What the ecologist said is that they are up, it's an uprising against development, against the fact that the government was interrupting the backward lifestyle by bringing them development, and therefore the Goldsmith, the WWF, are backing the Zapatista uprising. Uh, we have in production now, a, so something you'll find interesting, a map we found in one of the WWF Atlas of the World, which has is a map of called Indigenous Peoples Under Threat. It matches the hidden, you know, rhinos under threat, elephants under threat, indigenous peoples under threat. One more animal. Listed on that map is are the Mayans in the Lankadon jungle. That's Chiapas, for those that don't know. That's the Zapatista uprising. That's one of the indigenous peoples under threat that the WWF is uh, working on. I suggest one of the things also that people can begin to do is play with these maps. When you find the map of your country, look at it. You know your country. For example, Mexicans have been very interested when you map the density of ecological zones and protected areas on Mexico's oil production region. You find a very interesting story. It's the heart of Mexico's oil production region. Next. Now we want to go to North America, and I want to conclude with this, but the, I, I specifically emphasize this because too many people tend to think that this is directed only against the developing sector, that this is a strategy of which the United States and the northern nations are exempt. And I think as you examine that map, you'll see that that is not the case. In the case of Canada, I don't know if you can see it. Says number three, the striped area. All can you see it on the north? The striped area on the north. Now you may, in your mind, think that's Canada. In the Queen of England's mind, that's a new nation called Nunavut, which you may not have known about before. I didn't until we began this. Created in 1993, by 1999, that is to be an independent nation of that much of Canada. And it is a nation created for the Inuit uh, Indians. It is, this, is in, this is the autonomous, separatist, geopolitical strategy moving into action. The other stripe in the other direction, number two, is what the Cree Indians are claiming of Quebec, and it's two-thirds of Quebec. So in Canada, you see the face of the same thing that we saw in Central and South America, the beginning of the division of these nations, the split up of these nations, through so-called indigenism. Now then we go to the United States that many people think as a great power, right, exempt from this. And I, I submit to you that if you look at the degree of areas under control, it tells a story that one most Americans have to understand and other people have to understand as well. Here are your straight, the dark areas are your straight protected areas, various, the, the categories that I mentioned before. Your Bureau of Land Management lines, which are the lighter brown, technically do not have to be absolutely protected. There's some human activity allowed on these lands still. However, that is rapidly being changed, particularly under the direction of the Interior Secretary, Bruce Babbitt, a member, was to be chairman of the Inter-American Dialogue before he went into the 
the Clinton administration uh, now involved in a scandal in uh, Houston with Margaret, Tha uh, Margaret Thatcher's son. Um, and he's been one of the prime British agents within the administration that has been turning this huge area of land, largely into the West, into, through ecological uh, regulations into an area in which mankind cannot move. Human activity is not allowed. And if you look at this, what you see then is the entire western part of the United States, and look at Alaska, the similar picture, being kept out of development, being kept for beginning the balkanization of the country. And I think the last slide. This, what we're looking towards, if this is not stopped, is uh, this thing, this is a, a project published in 1981, a book called The Nine Nations of America, to balkanize, divide up the United, North America as a whole. The islands, this is called, this is Mexamerica, Cascadia, or Ecotopia is given to the number two. Uh, number one, look at that, it's called the Empty Corridor, and isn't that exactly what we just saw in the, uh, in the maps before? New England, I guess they're going to just go back to slave trading, that's what's left for them etc. Um, and so what you have here is a operational plan of which no nation, and particularly not the United States, is exempt, being carried out by this group of people who are committed to eradicating the nation state itself as an existence on this planet and reducing man to species, 5,000 different species, each with a different culture, uh, living in the most horrible, primitive backwardness one can imagine. And I submit we should have questions. The operations in your country are largely run out of the Australia wing, as you probably know, of the WWF, right? The, uh, which is run by a guy named Malcolm Parker, who was the extra equerry, that is, the chief aide to Prince Philip for a long time. There got to be a big scandal because his wife divorced him because uh, she maintained that he was spending all his time in nightclubs with Prince Philip, where the only thing the women wore who were dancing on the stage was Freemasonic aprons. So he got in a big scandal. He was kicked out of England or had to leave England in disgrace. He went over to become the personal uh, aide de camp to Prince Bernard. Same thing happened, and he wound up in Australia, from which he's directing the operations, which I want to show you. Now, if you look at this, this is just quite incredible, right? Look at this. This is the protected areas under, being given so-called to the Aboriginal population. Now, look at this. this. This is not everything. What's actually been created now is an unbroken virtually, except for tiny little areas across the transcontinental highway there, reserve to actually break the nation in part in two right the green areas here are the lands that are claimed you're probably aware of the famous mabo decision of 1992 right which opens up all land to anybody who says well i once was an aborigine or maybe my great great grandfather was the incidence of aborigines has gone up threefold once mabo happened right because if i have any aboriginal land well then why don't i just grab melbourne uh, one tribe grabbed Brisbane, grabbed downtown Brisbane, or tried to, and then finally they cut a deal and they gave it up. It's just, it's chaos in the whole area. So the idea is to actually totally disintegrate the texture of the country as a sovereign country. And I think the point that Webster made is, is the crucial one for all of us to remember. We, back in 1981-82, we called the WWF. We had, we and other journalists associated, we, we called those guys. And because our hypothesis was, well, aren't they stealing all the, say, diamond area? And there's a lot of diamonds out through there, right? Uh, or in the case of in Namibia. Most of the area in Namibia that's locked up along the coast is the diamond-rich area. Same thing with Botswana. The whole, the whole diamond belt of Botswana is locked up. So we, you know, you know, being a little bit suspicious after dealing with these characters for a long time, we said, well, is this to lock up raw materials? The WWF guy himself said to us, no, that's the old form of imperialism. What we're preparing is for a cataclysmic collapse of human civilization where as much as 95 to 98% of the population will die 
and we will rebuild out of the ashes, we who have, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, means of control. And he said the 1001 Club is a club modeled upon whites or boodles or the famous London clubs, right? Where you have to be requested to join and be backed by two other sponsors in order to be allowed in. It's not just any guy who has ten thousand dollars. Interestingly, he pointed out that one of the reserve, excuse me, the reserves that the thousand one club was looking to flee to, when the chaos descended, was Australia. And so I guess Prince Philip has sent his old buddy, his old drinking buddy Malcolm Parker, down there to prepare the way. So as far as Papua New Guinea, look out, and perhaps we could talk a bit more afterwards about that situation. Yes. I think there's another dimension to this as well. Uh, remember, constantly keep in mind that the overarching policy commitment of the WWF apparatus is to, over the next two to three generations, drive the population of the world to well below one billion people. It's at over five billion people right now. So that gives you a rough idea of what their general demographic concepts are. And in their literature, they've been very explicit about the kinds of things that they wish to do to make this possible. Uh, Bertrand Russell, who was one of the architects of this genocidal outlook, uh, lamented the fact that the existing levels of disease, pestilence, famine, and warfare that were going on towards the closing years of his life which was the 1960s, was insufficient to accomplish this task. And so he said some extremely distasteful measures are going to have to be taken up in order to reach these kinds of objectives. Now, one of the sine qua nones of the entire WWF agenda is the complete and total elimination of any form of economic development. Teddy Goldsmith, who's the older brother and the philosophical mentor of Sir Jimmy Goldsmith, who's probably the more well-known of the two, <clears throat> has written a number of books which he was criticized for by some of the WWF people because he was letting a bit too many of the secrets out on the table. Uh, he wrote a book in 1966 called Blueprint for Survival in which he advocated the most radical population and control policies that have been denounced all over the world that have been carried out by the Chinese government and others, namely forced sterilization, literally infanticide and measures like this to reach the intended population goals. He proposed in 1966 a permanent global ban on all migration so that wherever you are in the world, you're stuck there. And then more recently in 1980, he wrote a book called The Great U-Turn in which he said that all of the evils of civilization and all of the problems of civilization have been caused by industry, industrialization, and the advent of modern technology. And therefore, it's essential to turn the clock back radically and go back to literally a early form of global feudalism. WWF carefully studies the maps of every region that they've targeted and in their minds, the first target that must be destroyed is any potential project that would represent economic development that would improve the material, cultural standards of living of the population living in that area. And as Gretchen said, the advanced sector is by no means excluded from this. In Europe, the WWF spokesmen have recently been completely explicit about the fact that they intend to destroy every proposed plan for the economic reintegration of East and West Europe. They have set up parks for life, which are specifically earmarked to be choke points against every major proposed high-speed rail line and other infrastructure project that would fundamentally end the Cold War period by reintegrating Eastern and Western Europe, which creates the potential for the economic development of all of Eurasia. In Mexico, in Africa, in every part of the world where there are oil reserves, those areas are targeted for shutdown because these people are evil, they're insane, but they're not stupid. They know that the key to population density, the capacity for a society to increase its population,
by advancing its levels of public health, culture, education, and technology is the energy throughput. And they know that there is far from a shortage of oil. They control certain global strategic raw material preserves, oil preserves, and they target certain new potential expanded oil reserves. They've decimated any prospect of nuclear energy as a viable future source of energy for this planet. And they do all of these things not to make a buck, although they always bear in mind that replenishing their coffers is an aspect always of their geopolitics. Their goal is to make sure that they prevent any kind of expansion of energy availability, which is the crucial factor in being able to bring development rapidly to parts of the world that they've prevented from that. So they've got a world map and any region which is an area that could rapidly produce and bring to market vast amounts of oil, particularly as a transition into a post-petroleum nuclear technology era, uh, is going to be a priority strategic target because it's the antithesis of the mass murder that they're out to accomplish.